Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our Seven Bridges uh, webinar. Um, so my name is Xavier. I'm a scientific engagement manager. So together with me is my dear colleague, Vladimir, who is a very knowledgeable bioinformatics analyst specializing in neoantigen discovery. Um, so in this webinar, we are very excited um, to share with you some of our very new neoantigen discovery workflows. Uh, which will enable you to accurately predict your immuno-oncology um, targets. Next slide, please. So in this webinar, uh, we will start with an overview of our company, Seven Bridges. Um, not only who we are, uh, what we are known for, but also how we can make your research life more productive and hassle-free. Uh, then I will switch gear to the new antigen discovery. Uh, where I will tell you some background stories about new antigen. So essentially what they are and why researchers are so fascinated by them. Then I will trans transition to Vladimir, um, who will elaborate more on the latest advances in cancer immunotherapy using new antigen. He will share with us the successful story in new antigen discovery and to showcase some of the very new workflows in that context. And after that, we will open the floor for a Q&A um, so if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box below and we'll respond accordingly. And I hope that uh, by the end of this webinar, you will recognize and appreciate the full capability and the capacity of our platform to make your project from mission impossible to possible and hassle-free. Next slide, please. So who are we? Um, so Seven Bridges is a global biomedical data company specializing in software and data analytics to accelerate scientific discovery for our partners, both in academia and industry. We're a um, over 10 year trusted brand with a strong track record in delivering end-to-end -end bioinformatics solutions to our users around the globe. Uh, with us, you will have full access to our industry leading bioinformatics platform, personalized scientific and bioinformatics services, transformative analytic approaches, as well as the largest federated genomics data set. And with all these in place, we help you to advance your research path from raw experimental data to insightful discovery, which can lead to innovative treatments or diagnostics. And over the years, our credentials and capability has been well established by the community as evident from all those awards that we have been receiving. Next slide, please. Um, so for every single researcher, including myself, uh, we all wish that our research journey can be a very simple, straightforward one-way street where you start with an actionable hypothesis, then you do your experiments or analysis, then right off the bat, you have your novel biomarkers identified, uh, which in turn advance your clinical study or de drug development. However, in reality, it's not the case. Um, oftentimes, we have to go through iterations of testing and retesting of your hypothesis, um, which is very daunting and ineffective. So our goal here is to shorten your time and effort going through this iterative cycle um, in which every single researcher has to go through. And we can help you to reach your research goal as quickly as possible. As a result, you can move on to your next phase of your research project with full confidence. And to achieve this, there are three key successful elements that we will provide. First, the data set. Apart from your own proprietary data set, we also host multiple key signature public data sets. Next slide, please. So over the years, one of the top asks from the research community is to have a very simple and effective way to access any public data set of their interest. Um, so with that, Seven Bridges have invested resources and efforts to build multiple key signature public mm -hmm. projects. And we make these public data sets readily available and easily accessible by our community. Examples of these public projects are the CCLE, the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, which is a joint effort among the uh, Broad Institutes, Novaris Institutes, as well as the Genomics Institutes of Novaris Foundation, aiming to characterize close to a thousand cancer cell lines. Another great resource for the cancer community is the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a collaborative effort between the NCI and the NHGRI in profiling over 20,000 primary cancers across 33 cancer types. We also have the Human Cell Atlas, which is a great resource for a single cell study as well. Apart from the genomics data, we also support other omics and clinical data sets such as CBTAG, as well as the Cancer Imaging Archive. Next slide, please. 
And the second key element that will make you successful is our tools and workflows. In parallel to bring your own proprietary pipelines or applications, we also provide a collection of public tools and workflows. Uh, next slide, please. So right on our platform, our public apps gallery have hosted over 400 gold standard tools and workflows, which are ready for you to plug and play. To date, there are over 100 individual toolkits spanning across 60 plus applications, which includes RNA-seq, REST analysis, whole genome sequencing, as well as single cell study. And this public app gallery is curated, maintained, and kept expanding by our Bioinformatics team. It is highly optimized for the cloud, fully extendable and customizable to meet your specific needs. On top of that, you can also customize any of these um, public tools and workflows using our Web Composer. So our vision here is to help our users, regardless of their programming experience, to succeed in their projects. So with that, we have developed a very intuitive GUI-based Web Composer, which allows users to customize tools and workflows by simply dragging and dropping, as shown in this animation here. So with that, you don't need to worry about typing pages of pages of code. Instead, our platform will generate the code for you on the fly. And for every single parameter, you can set it to be exposed to users or locked so that you can have a full control on the accessibility of the tool or workflow. And on top of that, every single version of the tools can be saved and retrievable right on our platform. This enables you to run your project using the same version of the tools every single time. And all these tools are wrapped in Docker's containers in CWL, the common workflow language. This makes the tool very portable, shareable, and reproducible. Next slide, please. So for the power user, you can also easily bring in your tools and workflow to our platform using our SDK or software development kit. Along with the Docker and CWL, it will provide you remarkable portability, reproducibility, and scalability. This makes your tool migration in and out of a platform a very seamless and hassle-free process. Likewise, our version control feature will enable you to um, save and retrieve all versions of your tools right on our platform. So running the tool today should get you the same result versus another individual running it some down, uh, someday down the road. Next slide, please. On top of that, our platform is established based on the FAIR principle, which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. We achieve this vision by engaging with the community standard organizations. Historically, CWL is founded by us and our partners. Um, since the inception, it has been widely adopted by over 30 academic and industrial partners, which includes NCI and as well as GA4GH, um, to maintain the standard data formats and databases for genomics. Quoted from the file compute object specifications, our workflows along with the CWL are dubbed as the appropriate ways to exchange workflows. Next slide, please. And the third key element which set us apart in supporting our users is our well-established cloud-based infrastructure along with our strong scientific and bioinformatic services. We are not just a platform company, but we are a strong team of over 200 engineers, scientists, as well as mathematicians located in different time zones. With that, we have the full capability to support our users around the globe and to ensure that their time-sensitive projects can run robustly right on our platform. This is in particular very important for any large-scale and complex clinical processing, such as neural antigen. Next slide, please. And in this webinar, we'll have neural antigen as our use case to demonstrate our platform capability. As a brief intro, um, new antigens are essentially peptides that are presented specifically on the surface of the cancer cell. And this new antigen can trigger immune system where T cells with the right receptors can bind to the new antigens and elicit the killing process of the cancer cells. And this cancer killing process using your own immune system is called immunity induced tumor regression or immunotherapy in short. In contrast to the chemotherapy, which is a standard cancer regimen, Immunotherapy offers a very high specificity, which only kills the cancer cells and leaves the normal cells intact. So with that, leveraging neoadjuvants for guided treatment has emerged to be the definition of personalized cancer immunotherapy. And that's the reason why researchers are so fascinated by neoantigen. Next slide, please. And of course, any fascinating project will have its own challenges. Um, new antigen in particular is a very challenging project in which they are a very unique entity among individuals. 
So in a clinical study with a very large cohort of patients, you will anticipate a very large and complex data sets to manage. Not only do you have to have the capability to process them, but also you have to process them fast enough in the clinical setting. Apart from the population level, each analysis per patient can also be very complex. This is due to the fact that we need to capture as many features or mutational events as possible to improve the accuracy in the prediction of new antigen. And these features will include variances in somatic, germline, RNA levels, as well as RNA expression and HLA typing. All these combined take a significant amount of development efforts and resources. Currently, there are no best practices workflow in place for new antigen analysis. There's also no true sets available for evaluating analysis in a new antigen prediction. So with all these challenges that I have laid out here, how can we make this new antigen analysis from mission impossible to possible? So with that, I would like to transition to Vladimir and let him share with you our successful story in a new antigen discovery and to showcase our new new antigen workflow, which is by far one of the most complex workflows living on the platform. So with that, Vladimir, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Xavier, for the wonderful introduction and special thanks to Jen and uh, Abby for organizing this uh, webinar and giving us the, the opportunity uh, to show last three years of our work that we did on uh, discovering new antigens. So be before digging into uh, the details about the, the flow itself uh, and the, the methods being used, uh, I would like to, like to give you a short introduction about the cancer immunotherapy uh, in order for you to, to better understand the, the significance of uh, uh, accurate uh, new antigen prediction and discovery. So first traces of immunotherapy uh, date back to 25 uh, centuries BC when uh, uh, one of the Egyptian pharaohs uh, used poultice with, uh, uh, with incision uh, to, to treat some, some type of, of cancer and he managed to obtain some small uh, regression of it. And uh, only uh, 40, 45 centuries after that, uh, the proposition for using can cancer immunotherapy as a treatment appeared for the first time in the show house when Dr. Chase was uh, supporting it as a treatment to one of his patients. The therapy which would uh, train the immune system to recognize and destroy uh, cancer cells and leave the healthy cells uh, alone. Uh, not that much that the screenwriters uh, of the house were prophets, but the, the large advances in, uh, in, in sequencing technology uh, enabled, uh, uh, enabled huge growth in uh, cancer immunotherapy, which largely relies on this, uh, on this area. And uh, we can uh, surely say that uh, nowadays we live in a, in a golden era of cancer immunotherapy. So first, uh, the general definition, something what Dr. Chase said on the previous slide. So any artificial stimulation of the immune system that uh, can be used to, to treat cancer. There is a rough division of uh, cancer immunotherapies into this, uh, uh, this three groups. So most of them fall into, into one of them. First is, uh, uh, includes uh, checkpoint blockades, uh, inducing tumor uh, tumor cell destruction. Uh, they target special receptors on the surface of the cell used to, to restrain uh, immune reaction. Uh, the third group is consisted of uh, programming uh, uh, immune cells, so uh, identifying first potential uh, neoantigens and uh, extracting T cells from the patient and returning them back to, uh, to the patient. And the second group is consisted also on, on uh, identifying potential neoantigens and the creating vac vaccines from them and then administer them back to, to the patient. So far, there are uh, 18 uh, approved uh, gene therapy products and uh, uh, some of them is uh, in, in, the group, in this group is this viral therapy also. Uh, which uh, which is uh, which is different from from this this free and it's consisted of injecting a, a virus into melanoma and where it multiplies and destroys directly uh, cancer cells. So next few slides will uh, uh, will go a little more deeply into each one of uh, these groups. So checkpoint uh, blockade targets uh, uh, usually PD1 or CTLA4. Uh, uh, receptors on, on cells uh, which are used to uh, restrain and better control the intensity of the uh, of the immune response. 
uh, unfortunately, some types of cancer uh, exploit this mechanism and grow their own PDL1, for example, receptors, as you, as you can see on the on the first image. And when these receptors bind to, to the T cell, they de deactivated it. And even when uh, T cell recognized the uh, recognize the new antigen on the on the surface, it cannot start uh, the apoptosis pathway and destruction of, of the cell because it's being deactivated. So these drugs in the form of uh, antibodies, they, uh, they, they administer to the patient and they bind to each of these uh, receptors and they enable activation of the T cells when a uh, new antigen sequence is, uh, is recognized. So it's so it's not personalized therapy. It can be used on uh, several, um, in many patients. And uh, it started, targeted uh, uh, malignancies with a large uh, mutational burden. Uh, and the uh, last couple of years, it's also been used with uh, many other uh, types of cancer, such as melanoma, lung cell, kidney, bladder, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and ovarian cancer. Uh, also, it's uh, it's very important what can be seen from the uh, from the Nobel Prize in 2018, which was uh, which was given for uh, independent work of two scientists scientists working exactly on checkpoint blockade based drugs and treatments. So next next group is uh, consisted of uh, uh, programming uh, immune system cells and. Uh, First step uh, in it, as you can see on the image on the right, is consisted of uh, uh, removing uh, T cells from the patient's blood and uh, changing uh, their receptors uh, with uh, special chimeric antigen receptors, which uh, uh, recognize and target uh, exactly new antigen which is uh, present in a, in a certain type of cancer. After that, the uh, modified cells are multiplied several million times and uh, administered back uh, to the patient in, in several phases. Uh, there are a couple of uh, FDA-approved drugs uh, uh, based uh, in, with, with this therapy. First one is for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and second one is uh, for B-cell uh, lymphoma. And uh, the third group is consisted of uh, administering uh, uh, neoantigen directly to to the patient, uh, but first uh, let's uh, uh, let's see the process of uh, how neoantigens end up at the surface of the cell. So every cell in our body has mechanisms to cleave uh, endogenously uh, synthesized uh, proteins uh, in protosomes and uh, transfer these fragments uh, with special transport mechanisms through. Uh, and the plasmatic reticulum and Golgi apparatus into the surface of the cell where, uh, where they, with certain probability, uh, bind to, to MHC, uh, forming to major histocompatibility complex uh, molecules, protein, uh, uh, forming a MHC complex. Uh, this complex is uh, uh, expressed uh, at, the at the surface of the cell uh, presented to, to the cells of the immune system. And uh, in a way, it represents a, an indicator of uh, what is present uh, inside of the cells. So immune system cells, they, they scan uh, every cell in our body, like, uh, like a police officers, and check what's, what's present uh, inside. And if uh, uh, this fragment is uh, not uh, a wild type protein uh, usually present in the patient, if it is uh, uh, alternated due to somatic mutation, then it represents neoantigen, and it's present only on uh, on, on cancer cells. And the, the job of the immune system is uh, to destroy these cells and to save our organism. And this operation happens uh, thousands of times uh, every day. So this is uh, on the image of the right. You can see the the entire flow. Uh, of the neoantigen therapy and the treatment. So the first step is to perform sequencing, usually whole exome and transcriptome uh, of, the, of the patient. Uh, so the sample is taken from usually from the blood and from the tumor tissue. Uh, then the second step is uh, a neoantigen discovery, bioinformatics analysis. This is uh, what we do. This is what we will talk about in the rest of the uh, of the webinar and uh, the output of this part 
uh, is uh, a list of uh, prioritized and scored uh, new antigen candidates, uh, which are first uh, uh, further validated in the laboratory with uh, usually with flow cytometry, and uh, uh, then selected uh, new antigens uh, uh, are manufactured and uh, delivered in several ways. One of the ways to deliver them is uh, uh, through unformulated micro uh, RNA sequence, which encode this new antigen, and uh, it's usually administered uh, directly to the lymph nodes of the patient, where it's being swallowed by uh, immune system cells, macrophages, or dendritic cells, and uh, after swallowing them, the translation to, to the protein uh, will occur, and these uh, peptides, new antigens, will uh, will appear on the surface of the dendritic cells, uh, and uh, immune system will recognize them and uh, it will train uh, T cells which will through the bloodstream uh, circle the body and uh, locate the, the tumor which expresses the same antigens and uh, be able to destroy them. The second group is, uh, uh, is similar uh, it's similar delivery strategies just uh, uh, the new antigens uh, peptides are directly administered. So the downside of these first two uh, strategies uh, is that a huge number of uh, uh, of proteins of peptides and uh, microRNA is being degraded, and because it's unstable in the uh, intercell in, cell environment, that, that's why this fourth group uh, with the nano vaccines and biomaterials uh, is uh, many groups are, are working on it, and uh, the, its main feature is the, is that uh, synthesized new antigens. Uh, uh, proteins uh, are more sustainable in this environment, so the immune system has uh, uh, more time to, to absorb it before they are degraded. Uh, and the third group, uh, it's consisted of uh, uh, taking out from the patient's blood the dendritic cells and pulsing uh, uh, peptides directly, pu pulsing the antigens directly to them. And when they uh, present it on the, on the surface, uh, the the cells are returned to the patient, so uh, that, that way avoiding a huge possibility of uh, uh, new antigens being destroyed in a, in a patient's uh, intercell, intercellular in environment. And also it's important to mention that the, these uh, therapies are almost always used in a combination with checkpoint uh, uh, blockade inhibitors. Uh, still, a new antigen cancer vaccine is a uh, is a very hot uh, area also in, in science and research. Uh, currently, there are 4,400 mentions in papers since 2019 and uh, uh, a little less than 1,500 in, uh, only in 2020. In this table, you can see some of the, uh, some of the research is being conducted, some of them in clinical trials, in preclinical studies, some of them are in uh, phase one or phase two. Studies and they include uh, uh, several different types of cancer. Uh, similarly, with checkpoint blockade, first it uh, it's been used with the uh, uh, with the tumors with large uh, mutational burden, but last couple of years it's been also used with the with other types of tumor which has uh, a small, much smaller mutation burdens such as uh, glioblastoma. And uh, it's important to mention some downsides of the. Uh, of the immune therapy. Uh, first is the possibility of developing autoimmune response or, uh, or disease. Uh, this is especially present in a, uh, in a CAR T cells therapy. So it's very important to uh, investigate very thoroughly the immunogenicity of the, uh, of, of the new antigen candidates being administered and uh, uh, make sure that uh, they are usually not, they are not present in other tissues uh, uh, of the body where uh, because they can be attacked by patient's uh, uh, immune system and uh, still unfortunately this uh, kind of treatment is very expensive and still not available to the majority of the population but uh, uh, it's getting uh, better together with grow of uh, together with fall of the price of sequencing technology also the the price for manufacturing uh, uh, peptides and vaccines will will go down so uh, we we hope in the uh, in next uh, next couple of years or decade will uh, become available to to the majority of the of the population. So we'll go to 
to new antigen discovery uh, workflow and so you show you this uh, bioinformatics analysis uh, that uh, that can discover uh, and prioritize new antigens from the uh, from the patient so this workflow represents uh, a very high level image uh, representation of uh, uh, new antigen discovery uh, it has several several processing units uh, on input it receives uh, row sequenced reads from both normal and tumor tissue uh, together with the rna and uh, it performs uh, germline and somatic variant calling which includes reconstructing of the uh, or reconstructing of the patient's uh, uh, dna sequence uh, it is uh, it is very important to to perform this in order to to have accurate uh, uh, new antigen candidates and usually this uh, reconstructed is done uh, using a reference genome and uh, uh, and uh, 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 information that uh, uh, we share the majority of, among humans share the majority of the dna so we have something like 99.6 uh, same uh, same dna code and the output of this part is filtered variants which are uh, using our custom scripts uh, or scripts for extracting proteins and uh, uh, creating uh, new antigen candidates. And the last step is uh, it's consisted of scoring of each new antigen candidate and uh, outputting the list of prioritized candidates. And this is how the workflow looks like on, on Seven Bridges platform. It's the same as in the previous images, it's consisted of uh, several processing units so each one of these uh, green circles is a uh, is a sub sub workflow and uh, consisted of uh, other embedded bioinformatics tools the gray ones are inputs and the uh, and the outputs are on on the right uh, and uh, as savia mentioned same as every our every workflow on seven bridges platform it's fully described in a Common workflow language, make, making it uh, portable and reproducible. It is the uh, most complex uh, workflow. Uh, the platform consisted of total 130 bioinformatic tools, and it executes uh, in seven to, to 14 hours, uh, depending on the mutational burden of and the cancer cancer type. Um, just an as illustration, if uh, we we didn't. Uh, uh, we didn't put the tools into into sub workflows. Uh, this is how it, it would uh, uh, it would look like with the, all the tools on one one canvas. So it's a uh, it's a little messy. Of course, we, we don't want to to have it uh, like this without logical units. So this diagram shows a little uh, uh, little more detail uh, representation of the processing inside the antigen discovery workflow uh, as you remember the inputs are sequenced reads from tumor and normal in fastq format and uh, after the the alignment uh, step to aligning the reads to the reference genome and hla typing we perform uh, somatic variant calling variant uh, filtering then phasing of the variants uh, uh, then variants uh, are dividing into two groups uh, where each group belongs to the same haplotype and then we perform a translation to the proteins. And uh, when we create new antigen candidates, we, uh, we score them by predicting MHC binding. Uh, it's a probability that uh, certain new antigen candidate will appear on the surface of the cell. And then all the results together with RNA data is fed to this analyzed epitopes tool, which uh, aggregates all the data and outputs scored new antigen candidates. So I suppose uh, this uh, uh, this diagram is pretty complicated, especially if you are not uh, that much into bioinformatics. Uh, that's why we we decided to to divide it into several uh, several processing phases, which we will show on next uh, couple of slides. So this here is just an illustration how the the entire flow works, and the next couple of slides will go in more details. Uh, through every every unit. So the first uh, first part of the workflow is consisted of DNA calling and uh, uh, and HLA typing. So for tumor and normal reads, we perform alignment with BWMM and uh, 
uh, we perform HLA typing from the uh, from the tumor uh, tumor sample, and then aligned reads from both tumor and normal tissue are fed uh, to to somatic variant calling. There we use two tools uh, for for calling. Uh, one is the Mutec two, and second one is Strelka two. And we also perform germline variant calling with the GATK4 haplotype caller in order to uh, call the germline variants. So for accurate uh, uh, reconstruction of the genomic uh, sequence, uh, uh, we need to have both germline and, uh, and somatic variants. Uh, then as a final step of this stage, we perform optional filtering of DNA variants where we can, uh, we can optionally remove uh, some of the variants that are marked uh, as uh, low quality with, within these two callers. And we can also select uh, whether to use union uh, or intersect of these two somatic callers. So if uh, our analysis uh, requires uh, a large recall, if we want to cover all possible new antigen candidates, then we will select union here. And if we are more interested in uh, in precision, uh, then we, we want to uh, target, for example, uh, only variants uh, that uh, are being called by both uh, somatic callers. So we would select uh, intersect here. And uh, uh, all germline and somatic variants uh, uh, are uh, uh, passed to, to the output of, of this section. Uh, next, in parallel with, with that, we perform uh, RNA expression and variant calling. For RNA expression, we, we use Salmon uh, workflow. We also have support for, uh, uh, for RSAM. Uh, and uh, for uh, RNA variant calling, we, uh, we did it uh, uh, according to uh, GATK best practices for uh, RNA seq. So it starts with the uh, star aligner and uh, uh, it includes split and cigar reads, base recalibration, and the uh, couple type caller. The output of this part is uh, uh, RNA variants and the uh, RNA expression table, uh, where for every transcript uh, inside the gene annotation from the gene annotation file, we uh, we give a score of transcripts per million that uh, represent its uh, expression. And next part uh, is consisted of uh, uh, let's say translating or applying variants to the reference genome and uh, extracting new antigen candidates. And this illustration shows uh, this uh, very complex uh, process in a, let's say, less complex manner. Uh, you can see a couple of uh, variants that fall on certain positions of the, uh, of the genome. Uh, for example, a variant that falls into intern sequence, it's currently being uh, ignored because it cannot make alternation in a, uh, in a protein sequence. And uh, for example, this variant, uh, which is somatic uh, and which falls into, uh, into coding region, it uh, makes changes in the, uh, in the reference genome uh, sequence. And after translating it, transcribing it to RNA and, and uh, translating it to protein, it makes a change from the reference genome into one amino acid, let's call it altered amino acid. And if we extract this part uh, uh, of the protein, of the patient's protein around this altered amino acid with some area, it's default 10 amino acids from, from each side, but it's also configurable for every analysis. Uh, this uh, uh, protein, it's called new antigen nest. Uh, why it's called new antigen nest? Because uh, uh, it gives birth to uh, to the new epitopes, as you can see uh, next. So new epitopes are sequences in size from, let's say, eight to fifteen uh, amino acids, and they include uh, uh, this altered amino acid, as you can see here. So, and the final step is uh, uh, to assign each of these new epitopes uh, HLA type, and uh, this pair. So new epitope plus HLA type, it creates new antigen candidate. So this is, uh, this is new antigen candidate. This combination uh, of the new epitope, uh, altered peptide sequence by somatic mutation and HLA type. 
And this is how is the, this protein extraction and prioritization done inside the, the workflow. So uh, on, on the input, we receive filtered uh, DNA variants and HLA types uh, and together with the RNA expression and the RNA variants. So first, uh, here we perform phasing of the variants. On the next slide, uh, uh, we'll show the simple example of uh, uh, variant phasing so you will understand better its, uh, its significance. Uh, and then after this stage, the variants are divided into uh, two groups where each group contains uh, uh, variants that are present on the same haplotype. Uh, we call it uh, maternal and, uh, and paternal. And uh, each part uh, creates their own neoantigen candidates. And uh, for every neoantigen candidate, we perform uh, MHC binding prediction. It's a process which makes uh, scoring of the neoantigen candidates by giving them probability that they will uh, appear on the surface uh, of the cancer cells. And uh, we, we do it uh, with several uh, currently available tools such as NetCTL pen, NetMHC pen, Pickpocket, uh, MHC nuggets. And scores for all of these tools together with the uh, RNA expression and RNA variants are fed to this final aggregation to analyze epitopes, uh, which uh, performs uh, additional optional filtering of the candidates, uh, such as uh, uh, removal of the wild type proteins. Uh, for exa example, it can happen that some of the neoantigen candidates, some of the protein sequences is present in wild type protein database, which is an input, another input for this tool. And uh, we can optionally remove uh, this. Uh, uh, by default, they are removed, but can be turned off it if, if necessary. Uh, and the second example of filtering is that we can uh, remove uh, all neoantigen candidates that originate uh, from variants that are not called with uh, uh, with RNA. And uh, we can set, for example, the, the binding weight. So at the end, when uh, we give the final score of the neoantigen candidate, we can uh, decide whether to, to trust more, uh, whether to trust more the binding prediction score from some tool or RNA expression. Also, we take into account uh, uh, RNA variants. Uh, so why, why we do that? Uh, because with the RNA expression, uh, we receive results about uh, uh, expression for a certain uh, transcript, uh, but we don't have information whether this transcript is, uh, whether this allele is uh, uh, reference or alternate. So whether really the allele uh, which contains this new antigen mutation is expressed or the other one. So, uh, but when the RNA variant is called, then uh, we are certain that uh, uh, the expression of, uh, uh, of the alternate uh, uh, allele is, uh, is really, uh, really expressed. And as I, as I said, this is a simple example of, uh, that shows significance of performing variant phasing. Uh, you can see here two heterozygous variants which are very close one from, from the other. And when we perform, uh, uh, we want to perform the reconstruction of the nucleotide sequence from these two variants. So since they are, uh, they are close, we can, uh, uh, we can form here four uh, possibilities. And each of these four possibilities uh, will code different, different protein, thus it will uh, call different uh, neoantigen candidate. But uh, as, uh, as a common fact, we are diploid organisms, we don't have four haplotypes, so two must be wrong. And how could we know uh, which two are uh, correct and which two are wrong? Uh, we can know that uh, only with the uh, information uh, about phasing of the variant. So if this uh, information is present, so we have a special tool that uh, uh, performs phasing of the, uh, of the variants. So if this uh, information is present, we can uh, know exactly which variants go together and which, uh, which don't go to, together and uh, eliminate this uh, false two uh, peptides and keep only two uh, that are correct. And the final uh, outcome of the, uh, of the workflow is this, 
uh, set of scored and prioritized new antigen candidates together with the huge number of information that could uh, uh, that, that could benefit uh, to additional filtering or uh, giving more or less trust to it. On the right side, you can see this uh, animation showing uh, this final outcome on the work of the workflow on our platform. Uh, and on the bottom side, you can see some of the uh, fields from the from the table with the new antigen candidates. Uh, first group uh, gives basic info, so the peptide sequence, HLA type, information about the som somatic variant. Uh, then next group, uh, it's uh, consisted of scores uh, uh, from several binding prediction tools that I mentioned. Also information whether this uh, peptide is present in wild type protein database. And we also calculate uh, agrotopicity, uh, which is very important uh, parameter. Uh, it shows the difference in, in a binding prediction score bef uh, between alternate allele and the reference allele for uh, this new antigen uh, candidate. And it's important uh, uh, to, uh, to have it uh, larger than zero, or sometimes larger than 0 0.1 or 0. Uh, two, it uh, gives more credibility to the new antigen candidate and uh, some, uh, um, some papers are considering uh, uh, agrotopicity as a criteria that uh, uh, candidate is a new antigen candidate, only if, it's, uh, if it, it has agrotopicity larger than, uh, than zero, it's called new antigen candidate. And we also provide additional information about the somatic variant uh, uh, consisted of uh, a variant allele frequency. Uh, it boosts its uh, reliability and both tumor variant allele frequency, which should be uh, larger than at least 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and uh, also normal variant allele frequency, which should be uh, close to, to zero. Uh, and uh, the last group is consisted of uh, uh, RNA parameters. So the list of uh, isoforms of uh, uh, of the gene uh, on which the mutation in the neo antigen candidate falls to, uh, transcripts per million score, uh, whether this variant is called in RNA, and uh, also expression in genotype of both reference and uh, alternate uh, uh, alleles. Uh, and this is an example of uh, the analysis of the task of neo antigen workflow on Seven Bridges platform. On the left side, you can see. Uh, reference files inputs, all necessary databases, reference genomes, index files, gene annotation files, and uh, you can see row reads. They are given uh, all on the same input in order to uh, allow batch processing of uh, more than one sample. So uh, this workflow has capabilities to, to process dozens or hundreds of uh, samples in uh, only a few clicks. So it will spawn a uh, dozen or a hundred instances for, for each sample and uh, run the workflow and provide the, the result. And uh, on the right side, you can see, uh, you can see some output, uh, faster files, VCF files with called variants and, uh, uh, and of course merge the epitopes, merge antigen candidates, the table that was shown on one of the previous slides together with some information about the number of uh, uh, of variants, of coding variants, and uh, etc. And as Xavier mentioned, uh, uh, the big challenge with this type of analysis is uh, uh, is validation. Currently, there is no uh, publicly available truth set or best practices workflow, uh, which is why uh, this Tesla this Tesla consortium was uh, uh, was found by by Parker Institute. It, the acronym is Tumor Neo Antigen Selection Alliance. It gathers more than 35 leading neo antigen research groups from both academia and industry, and they organize uh, challenges uh, in, in which uh, everybody is uh, welcome to participate. In, and they there they they provide uh, validated uh, sets for more than 30 uh, neo antigen candidates. Uh, they provide flow cytometry validated new antigen candidates so the participants can uh, test their uh, their workflows with them and several bridges participated in in three rounds round two x and uh, three of uh, this new antigen uh, challenge and uh, our workflow managed to 
detect and assign very high scores to, to the majority on, of the uh, flow cytometry confirmed neoantigen candidates. Uh, the details about detailed results uh, about this challenge uh, will uh, will be published soon by Tesla organizers, and uh, also we are preparing uh, our own uh, uh, own paper, uh, which will describe this uh, this workflow, its capabilities and uh, uh, and, and features. Uh, also, it's important to mention one more time the Tesla goals were. Uh, were to create uh, best practice neoantigen workflow and uh, uh, and the truth set. Um, last to to summarize a, a bit, uh, I always want to to point out these uh, two important thing, things distinguishes from uh, for our neoantigen workflow comparing to to the other publicly available solution. Uh, the first is that we perform integral neoantigen analysis described in a common workflow language so from fastq file to prioritized uh, and uh, scored with uh, many details neoantigen candidates with many optional filterings and prioritizations and the second advantage is that we perform and take into account the wide range of mutational events uh, this is implemented in, uh, in our custom scripts for uh, uh, protein extraction and uh, these changes include uh, uh, consider both germline and somatic variants, both SNPs and indels. Uh, uh, neighboring uh, SNPs and indels are also taken into consideration variants of stop codon, phasing of the variants, and customizable transcript selection file. And this is uh, uh, also one of the key elements that we plan to uh, to publish in uh, in our papers to to calculate the. Uh, importance of uh, each one of these uh, mutational events and uh, to calculate exactly uh, how many neoantigen candidates is lost if we, we don't take into account uh, one of these mutational events. And so for, for, for the end, uh, for, for those of you who, uh, who managed to, to stay this late this, to this part of the, uh, of the ve webinar, we, uh, we prepared a special treat. So we uh, we'll make, uh, we made available for a free tryout uh, the antigen workflow. Uh, if you are interested to test it, to see how it looks like on Seven Bridges platform, uh, you can just send requests to, to our support, uh, to, to support at sevenbridges.com. Just mentioned in, a, in the title that you want to test the antigen workflow and uh, give us just short explanation why are you interesting. And uh, we will create a, a free Seven Bridges platform account for you with the example of uh, uh, executed uh, neoantigen workflow. We will even put some uh, some credit uh, on it, so you can uh, you can process a few of your own samples if uh, if you're interested to test uh, how the workflow performs on uh, on your use case. And of course, for for any additional questions, we are uh, we are always open. Please be free. Uh, be free to to ask starting now uh, thank you thank you very much for for your patience and uh, uh, hope uh, hope to to hear uh, uh, feedback from you thank you Vladimir for the um, fantastic talk um, so now we are open for Q a um, if we cannot answer all the questions due to the time constraint uh, we'll respond the rest after the webinar so uh, please do not hesitate to pose any questions in the chat box below Okay, so we have the first question here. Um, so it's, that it, it's really impressive to see uh, your workflow can capture a variety of mutational events. Um, so with that, have you also considered to predict um, the immunogenicity of new antigen candidates? Oh, thank you, it's a, uh, it's a great question. Uh, it, it is uh, one of the, the final step uh, of the workflow. So to mention one, one more time, we are, uh, predict, we predicted the possibility of neoantigen candidate to appear on the surface of the cancerous cell. Uh, but the final step is to predict immunogenicity and the probability that uh, this candidate will actually bind to the T cells that are tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes uh, that are present there. And uh, with, uh, with that, uh, uh, for that prediction, we, we require additional data uh, 
for for T cell for sequenced T cell receptors of the cells uh, in the tumor environment, and it can easily be added to the workflow. Uh, th there are a couple of tools uh, that currently uh, can perform this type of prediction. One one of them is Net PCR, and uh, it's uh, on our list as one one of the next uh, steps for adding it to the workflow. And uh, important to add, uh, as similarly like with the uh, other uh, neoantigen and validated neoantigen data, it's really hard to, to find uh, publicly available uh, data that would uh, contain uh, raw reads from both tumor and normal and uh, also uh, uh, sequence uh, T cell receptors uh, in order to test uh, the, the entire flow. Okay, um, the next question is, um, is it possible to perform the uh, prediction of new antigen candidates if there's no um, RNA-seq data available for the patient? So in other words, uh, you only have the tumor normal DNA. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it, it is possible. Uh, we, the last tool in the, in the workflow that performs aggregation of the of results, uh, it is uh, uh, set in a, in a way uh, that uh, RNA data is uh, optional so uh, it will it will be ignored like it's not it's not there so the candidates uh, will be prioritized uh, only with the uh, with the mhc binding scores from the selected tool and uh, they will be scored so it, it is possible of course uh, it's important to mention without rna uh, the predictions uh, are not that much uh, reliable because we can uh, we can have candidates with a very huge binding MHC binding score, uh, but uh, they are not uh, really expressed in the RNAs. Thus, the the proteins from these transcripts uh, uh, from from these uh, nucleotides are really not uh, uh, not present in the patient in that cancer cells and not uh, expressed at the, at the surface. Uh, we have another question. Um, Says, do you run analysis on whole genome, or do you restrict it to chromosome six when uh, where the uh, MHC is encoded? Uh, it is possible to, to run it uh, also on uh, uh, on whole genome, and we don't run it only on uh, uh, MH six. So it's uh, uh, the entire exome of the patient. Uh, all the genes are are processed and. Uh, uh, we consider only chromosome 6 for HLA typing. So new antigens from uh, all genes are, uh, are tested and taken into account. Uh, with the, if whole genome sample is provided, uh, since new antigens are extracted only, uh, only from genes, uh, we will, uh, for, for now, the intron regions and regions outside of the genes will be ignored. Um, so there's a question asking, um, is it very impressive to see like the Tesla challenges? So um, if we've gone through and all the publications um, once gone through, uh, what's the consequence, what's the impact and what the end users would expect um, to benefit from these um, publications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the impact uh, of this uh, of this challenge and the results, it's, it's really huge because not only they they will uh, publish the results uh, of the workflows uh, from the participants, uh, but they also plan uh, uh, to to publish uh, all the test data. So all uh, all data that was used in a, in a challenge, they uh, they plan to to publish it of, at some at some point, uh, making it available to uh, to do anyone to research group laboratories. So uh, the researchers can build their own. Uh, prediction tools can test their their own workflows, can tune them. Uh, they can also uh, the community can, with the help of uh, of Tesla consortium, uh, come out at some point with the uh, uh, new antigen best practices uh, uh, workflow. And also, since it's very complex and there are uh, so many parameters uh, uh, of the workflow. Uh, the community can come out uh, with the optimal thresholds or, or optimal values for uh, uh, for some some parameters, and it, of course it's very important to, to mention why uh, why uh, the accurate uh, uh, prediction of neo antigen is uh, uh, 
uh, is, is a must have. So as, as mentioned during the, the talk about uh, cancer in immunotherapy, uh, it is very important that uh, these synthesized neoantigens are uh, really the proteins that are expressed at the surface of the cancer cells. So if, uh, if an error happened, we, some wild type protein can be, uh, can be synthesized and uh, it can provoke uh, autoimmune reactions. So it's, uh, it's very sensitive data and the, the validation for, for every step needs to be, uh, needs to be performed very, uh, very thoroughly. So I think we have time for the last question. Okay. Okay. So um, the last question is, uh, how does tumor heterogeneity affect the selection of new antigens? Uh, th this workload th does not consider uh, tumor hetero uh, heterogeneity so for, for now. So we, we only uh, have one, uh, one tumor sample in, uh, in, in the workflow and we, we calculate uh, uh, all the variants. And uh, it, of course, it's important to, to include it, especially because of the immune, uh, cancer immune editing. Uh, there are several researches that, uh, uh, that target this, uh, uh, the, the target this, uh, the, this effect. So it, it can happen that, uh, uh, that the uh, clones of the tumor, uh, they st stop expressing some of the neoantigen candidates that were predicted in the uh, primary tumor on, or in, in one of the first uh, clones of, of the tumor. And uh, th that, uh, uh, that points out that uh, uh, prediction of uh, neoantigen candidates, uh, it's not uh, uh, sufficient to, to do it only once. So it, it should be done uh, several, several times as the time, time passes by during the, during the treatment because uh, some of the neoantigen candidates can be lost uh, uh, in the in the patient, and maybe some uh, can some good or strong antigen candidates can uh, can appear. Okay, um, thank you so much, Vlad. Um, I think uh, that's all the time we have today. Uh, once again, we really appreciate your participation and all the good questions that you have posted um, here, and we'll also respond to the rest um, after this webinar. So please do not hesitate to leave any comments or questions in the chat box. And with that, we do look forward to seeing you again in our upcoming webinars. Um, thank you all and uh, have a good one. Thank you.